Okay, good morning or good afternoon, uh, wherever you're located. And uh, thank you very much for coming to our online teaching conference pre-webinar on open textbooks and learner accessibility. I'm Una Daly, uh, Associate Director of College Open Textbooks, and I'm here with Alex Kruger, President of Virtual Ability. And we're going to talk to you today about um, open textbooks and the evaluation that Alice and her company did for us this last summer in evaluating open textbooks for compliance with um, accessibility law and guidelines. Um, before I continue, um, if anyone would like to dial in, uh, there is the information there at the top of the screen. It's not necessary, but if you like to speak your questions and you don't have a headset, that option is available. Um, quick show of hands, um, who out there has used Illuminate before? All right, so it looks like we're, uh, uh, Alice and Kelvin and, and Jacques has used it. Okay, and Steve. Oh, all right, Marion and Randall. Okay, wonderful. So we've, um, we have a lot of people who have used it before. But it looks like maybe half of you may not be familiar with it. So I'm going to very briefly explain. Most of this um, kind of uh, interactive piece occurs in the left-hand column of your screen. The very first uh, window up there is the participants window, and you should see yourself in there and uh, the rest of us as well. And it shows how you're connected. So you either have a microphone or a phone next to you. Um, and um, directly underneath that window is the emoticons, and that's where you can raise your hand by uh, clicking on uh, the hand icon with the green arrow pointing up, um, or you can uh, give us a smiley face or a thumbs down, depending on how you're feeling about that presentation. Um, directly underneath that is the chat window, which um, probably will be the primary way that um, we interact during the presentation. but. Um, you may also um, pipe up and ask questions. Um, you may want to raise your hand first, if particularly if you're on the um, if you are on the um, microphone. So I'm just um, changing our maximum simultaneous speakers um, to three here, so that um, several of us can speak at once. And otherwise, just go ahead and type in that chat window. And there's your type comment. I've been. All right. And then directly underneath the chat window is your audio controls. If you are using the phone or a um, or a headset, um, you should be you should be looking at these audio controls. Particularly if you are on the phone, go ahead and take your audio controls all the way to the left to turn those off. If you're going to use a mic. Um, you're going to be clicking on and off um, here at the bottom. And when the mic is in the up position, that allows you to speak. And when the mic is in the down position, which is what you do when you're not speaking, that turns it off. Otherwise, we may well get an echo uh, from your machine. Any questions before we continue? All right, excellent. So uh, I would like to introduce Alice Kruger, the president of Virtual Ability, who is a former educational researcher and now um, has some um, disabilities. And she's also the leader of a support community for people with real life disabilities in Second Life. And uh, this community provides development and employment opportunities for people with disabilities. And I'm going to let Alice now explain for you a little bit about her organization and the work that they did for us this last summer. This is Alice. And very quickly, the picture there is obviously not my real life picture. That's my second life avatar. And she is known as Gentle Heron. And if you Google the two of us, she gets more hits than I do. So that tells me something. Um, Virtual Ability Inc. is a 501c3. And we do a lot of work in the world of Second Life, and we're starting into other virtual worlds as well, because we've been convinced that virtual worlds are a great place for people with disabilities to become more social, but also to learn employment skills and to be employed. 
and one of the examples of a project where we employed people with disabilities was this past summer when we worked with the College Open Textbook group to evaluate 60 of their textbooks. And we'll tell you more about our findings, but what I'd like to tell you about right now is that the people that worked on the project included people with PTSD, people with um, traumatic brain injury, people with autism, people, one woman who was completely blind from birth, and our project director is a woman who had just recovered a few months before from major brain surgery. I have MS and we work with people with all different kinds of disabilities and we've found that the virtual world is a great place for us. Thanks, Una. Thank you, Alice. And um, so at College Open Textbooks, we were really very pleased to work with Alice and her um, staff. Um, because um, they had a they had a lot of passion and, and interest in educational materials for learners with disabilities, and so this was really a win-win situation for all of us. So, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the associate director at College Open Textbooks, and um, I have a number of duties there. Um, one of the big ones uh, this last year was ex accessibility and uh, finding. Um, an accessibility expert company that could work with us on this uh, review of open textbooks. So. If you haven't um, done so, uh, please introduce yourself in the chat window. Um, maybe tell us what college you're with and, and why um, accessibility is important to you. And um, Briefly, uh, what we're going to talk about today is um, what are open textbooks for those of you who haven't um, been um, involved. We're briefly going to go over that and why digital resources can be a big help in accessibility. And then uh, Alice is going to go over the evaluation of her results. And um, finally, we're going to talk a little bit about um, next steps as um, for educators and for author creators of open textbook and open education resources, what do you need to know uh, going forward to improve your materials and select high quality um, open materials? So College Open Textbooks uh, started um, in 2008. It's a project of the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. And the mission was uh, finding, listing, and supporting the production and reuse of high quality, accessible, and culturally relevant open textbooks for community college students. But that mission, of course, needs to be achieved by reaching out to faculty um, who are the selectors of open textbooks, um, the adopters of open textbooks and um, in some cases the authors and creators of open textbooks. So that's been a big, a big part of our work over the last two and a half years. So open textbooks are digital um, formatted textbooks, uh, often available also in a printed format uh, for a low fee or uh, often um, the user of an open textbook may print that out. But the digital component is, is really an important piece of being able to work well with assistive, assistive technology. Although there are guidelines that need to be observed to make uh, these digital formats effective for assistive technology. Um, secondly, um, an open textbook has an open license. And, um, this, of course, allows you as an instructor uh, to adapt materials, reuse them, share them with other instructors, and of course your students. Um, but in particular, in the accessibility area, it allows materials to be adapted for a population, a special population that may have um, certain disabilities um, that need to be addressed. And finally, low cost is, is a huge a factor in um, open materials. Um, it lowers the barriers to education for all students, but in particular for students with disabilities who may have other costs associated with um, attending um, higher education institutions. And open materials can really assist with that. 
So I don't think it's any surprise to any of you that there's been a digital information explosion <laughs> over the last decade. Uh, and I think some of us, we feel like our heads are exploding with all of the information that's available. Uh, much of this has been driven by um, technology, which has made it easier to share data, um, and primarily the Internet. And of course, we, we now have new devices, uh, iPads and, and smartphones, which, which help us with that. Um, but what that has done, it's really turned traditional publishing and copyright on its head. Because um, this data, this information is available so freely on the Internet, um, students in particular um, and people who are not um, aware of copyright issues may think that is available freely to use. But in fact, most information on the Internet is um, still copyrighted um, in a traditional manner, which means that you can read it online, but you're not allowed to copy it or, sh or share it um, in its textual format. You can simply send links to everybody. So what came along with this explosion of information was a change in the way that materials could be um, licensed. And that was the whole open education movement, which started around the early 2000s. And um, there was a, an organization that kicked off what's called Creative Commons licensing. And that came out of Stanford University. And um, what it did with many open textbooks, what, or rather many traditional textbooks, it took them from an all rights reserved to a some rights reserved, which means that the author or creator or the copyright holder of the of the copyright holder can decide how the open textbook can be reused, and they th that licensing is available in the textbook, which allows you as an adopter of the textbook to reuse it without going directly to the copyright holder. And for instance, here at the bottom of um, each of our slides here, we have a Creative Commons license um, icon. This particular one, I don't know if you can read it, it says CC BY, which is Creative Commons BY. It has a little picture of a person. And so any of you may reuse our slides but you need to give attribution, so you need to say who is the person or organization that you got the slides from. And that is the least restrictive of the Creative Commons licensing um, models. And they sit on top of traditional copyright, but we at College Open Textbooks give away those other rights and say that you may use these materials that we have produced, but you must say that you got them from College Open Textbooks. And that's kind of the principle behind uh, the entire Creative Commons um, model. Here I've just, there are some different flavors um, of Creative Commons, but we call these the four R's of open um, and are very important for educators. So um, can you reuse the materials? Um, perhaps more importantly, can you revise them so that you can target um, special learners if need be? Um, this also um, involves translations. Um, so many open education materials are freely translated because an open license allows translation without getting permission. And, and you can see the rest of them here. So cost savings is, is the other really huge factor. And, and we show you here two introductory the community college textbooks for statistics. The one on the left-hand side is, is published by Wiley, a commercial textbook publisher. Uh, it has an all rights reserved, and it runs about $142 retail uh, for, uh, for purchase new. On the right-hand side, you see a book that has been um, licensed under a Creative Commons license. It uh, happens to have been written by a community college professor, actually two community college professors, uh, but it needn't be written by um, a professor. But you can see that it is downloadable and online for free. So big difference uh, in price. If you want a printed bound version, this book happens to be posted at the Connections Open, open um, Educational Resource Repository. and they. They provide a print-on-demand service, and this book can be purchased. 
uh, with shipping for $31.95. And it's a 500-page textbook, so it's uh, quite a good deal uh, on print-on-demand there. Any questions before I continue? Well, thank you, Randall. I see Randall is talking about um, the disability department at East Los Angeles College. And uh, thank you for that, um, Randall. And I, I did just briefly want to mention, because I was down in the LA Community College District um, recently at the end of February, on an, and I gave a workshop at um, LA Trade Tech on adopting open textbooks. So hopefully next time I'm down there, Randall, um, I'll be able to catch you uh, as well. So um, for those of us who are um, faculty and staff at community college, um, the price of textbooks really hits our students hard. Um, because community college is already the affordable uh, college solution, you can see here that um, a student at a community college, their textbooks nationwide um, cost 72% of their tuition. In California, because our community colleges are so affordable, um, tuition is 150% of tuition, or one and a half times a student's tuition is spent on their textbooks. And this is from a 2008 government um, study. All right, so why should you be concerned about accessibility of textbooks, um, open or otherwise? Well, <laughs> the most obvious one is that it's the law. The Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, in concert with the American with Disabilities Law, um, was enacted in 1998, and it says that all electronics and information technology must be accessible um, to um, any federal employees or students of um, public institutions or institutions that receive federal aid. So this covers quite widely um, all of our higher ed institutions. Um, for you as an instructor, um, producing accessible materials means that your materials can be used far more widely. Um, so it really extends the reach of your um, expertise. And finally, um, we, we have found um, not just we at College Open Text, but in general, um, that um, improving um, accessibility of textbooks makes for a better experience for all learners. And I'm just going to mention this now, and I'll, I'll probably talk about it a little bit later. Is um, many of many open textbooks actually have videos associated with them, and and more will in the future. Um, video captioning is. Um, is an accessibility requirement um, which says that videos need to have um, a caption underneath for those with audio impairment or hearing impairment. Um, in fact, uh, that does help, of course, uh, students uh, with hearing impairment, but in fact it also makes videos viewable in a library situation where it's not possible to play the audio tracks. It also is very helpful for um, English language learners because they can not only hear, but they can also see the language um, on the screen as well. So really um, these enhancements um, help everyone. So um, as I mentioned this last summer, uh, we worked with virtual ability to um, evaluate open textbooks. And our goals here were to empower faculty adopters so that they could make good choices around open textbooks and make sure that before they selected an open textbook that they understood how accessible it would be for its students. Um, and of course that helped to su support um, the, di the diverse learners that attend our, our community colleges and other higher ed institutions. Um, a second but equally important piece was the education of authors um, because we want to help authors to write those open textbooks um, correctly the first time so that uh, the, the wonderful resources that they're putting together are available for all learners. 
And at this point, I would like to turn it over to Alice to talk about her results. Sure. What we wanted to think about was the uh, diversity of the audience. So the first thing we thought we should <coughs> excuse me, consider were the challenges that learners face nowadays. And we are be noticing as instructors that our learners are becoming more diverse. We have students with cognitive learning disabilities. We've always had what we used to call in the old days slow learners. But now we know that some of these people are learning disabled. Some of these people have different sorts of memory impairments, and some of them have traumatic brain injuries. We also know that the returning veterans who are becoming members of our post-secondary classrooms have PTSD issues that can impact them. We know that we have students in our classrooms with sensory impairments, some who are deaf, some who are blind, some who are hearing impaired, some who are visually impaired. And we have students with motor impairments as well. Diverse learners also include those who have English language deficits. And as our communities become more diverse, our classrooms also reflect that diversity. And we have students who are not as well engaged in learning as we would hope. We looked also at the web accessibility guidelines that were available to us. And Una has, of course, mentioned the Section 508 legislation in the United States that is really important in terms of defining accessibility of electronically available information. Internationally, the web content accessibility guidelines from the W3C community are intended to address accessibility, not just for people with disabilities who use assistive technology, but also for different kinds of electronic devices that have limitations, such as mobile phones. And there are, of course, lots of collections of best practices about accessibility. And one of those that we looked at quite a bit were the PDF guidelines from Adobe that talk about making their product accessible. This is a snippet of a review that you can find on the COT website. And Una will give you a handout that has a whole bunch of different URLs on it at the end of the session today so that you can go to the website. But this is just one overall review of one of the textbooks and statistics that we did review. We looked at four different general criteria. And those are known by the acronym POUR, P-O-U-R. The P stands for perceivable, O for operable, U for understandable, and R for robust. The principles that are titled perceivable and understandable, those two principles are related because they both describe the mental processes of the learner. Perceivable information and the user interface components that allow access to that information can be sensed in some form by the user. Understandable information is material that can be interpreted, comprehended, and used by the learner. The principles of operability and robustness are related. Those both describe the usability of the medium that is providing the information. And operability describes the proper functioning of all the elements. Robustness means that this is designed to function properly, not only now, but in the future, using current and future kinds of assistive technology. And Una is looking is answering questions. This is great. She can answer questions while I don't even look at them. So we looked at the 60 top enrolled GE course textbooks that were open licensed. We first sorted them out and found 35 were websites, 25 were downloadable PDFs. We generalized the kinds of issues that we noticed. Some of them related to the structure of the website. Some of them related to the structure of the PDF. And then there were some common issues in both formats. We did find some positive findings, and I'll share all of those, and we made some recommendations. The five repositories that we sampled textbooks out of are listed here. 
and I want to compliment these folks for being in the forefront of open educational resources by making collections available to people that are easier to find. We did find that the repositories had structural problems. They are designed to make authoring easier. So they give the authors preset formats. However, we found that all of the repositories, every single book that we looked at from these five repositories had structural markup issues. 80% had color contrast issues, and 40% of the books had in-page navigation issues that related to making them inaccessible. Authors can also create their own websites, and there is a danger in that because most professors who are good at writing textbooks and great at curriculum development are not necessarily wonderful at website development. And so we noticed a number of issues in the author-created websites. A lot of them had structural semantic organizer issues or issues with tables. That was one of the more common problems. They also had difficulty with in-page navigation. When they tried to use Flash and Java, they often didn't do very well. And so these are some of the issues that authors created by making their own open textbooks on a website. Adobe lists a of features that are available in properly created PDFs that allow them to be accessible. Those are the little blue bullets that are here. None of those features were available in any PDF open textbook that we evaluated. 100% flawed. We also noted that because you got your PDF from a website, even if the PDFs had been totally accessible, if the website was inaccessible for any reason, that made the PDF also inaccessible. The issues that were in common in both formats, the web format and the PDF format, came from the authors. This was more stylistic. So here are noted a number of visual appearance issues. I'll just mention that they were, there were some specific issues with mathematical symbols. If they're put in as an image, if you're using a font that doesn't support the mathematical symbols and you put them into your textbook as an image and then don't support the image properly, the assistive technology can't read the symbols. And when you have a text in mathematics or statistics or science that uses an awful lot of these symbols, that can be a real problem. Visual clutter and inconsistency is a problem. This is a bad example, obviously, and I made this up. Nobody, you wouldn't expect anybody to see, it, to see anything this bad in a textbook, yet we did. The problem is it's very difficult to sort out what is the point of the information on this page. This uses different colors, it uses different fonts, it uses different sizes of text, it has images thrown in, very difficult to figure out. There are ways that an author can make their material more intellectually accessible. And Marion says visual clutter drives nuts. Yeah, I can't learn it that way, and this is a huge problem. Authors like to add in stuff to make it look prettier. Looking prettier isn't the point. Being clearer about what you're saying is the point. Another common issue was content organization. We found several issues with that. One of the major ones in the PDS was a lack of table of contents. And this can be a particularly huge problem if you put a PDF for each chapter up and then don't provide a table of contents. So you can't figure out which order to read the PDFs then. Language usage was another common issue. Content is developed using content-specific vocabulary. So having a glossary is extremely important. Consistency is also important here as well. And alt text is something that we've talked about a lot in the community, yet we found that 63% of the websites and 100% of the websites of the PDFs, excuse me, did not have or had inadequate alt text. Color coding is a real problem, 
anybody who's colorblind can explain why that would be an issue. And then although you expect as you go from the beginning of the text to the end of the text that the comprehension level would increase because your students are learning the content and they're getting better and so they can handle harder material, we found a lot of problems with the comprehension level varying wildly from chapter to chapter and not just gradually increasing. So here's what you would access as a blind user on our website. Basically nothing. You're not going to see anything because you're blind. Your screen reader will read the text that's on the screen and it actually does more than that. It reads a lot of the embedded directions. So for instance, it would tell you that it's going to read a table and it will tell you what the number of, of columns and the titles of the columns are in the table so that you can organize that mentally in your head. But if this was an art textbook, let's say, that you were trying to access as a blind student and it said look at the illustration and you will see why the Baroque period was known for its excessive ornamentation and if the alt text said figure 5, you wouldn't really get a lot of information by looking with your screen reader at the, at the image. And the same is true for science textbooks that use a lot of diagrams, for math textbooks that will use a lot of graphs. The alt text description really is important. Not just that it be there, but that it be adequate. Accessible resources is really important, Randall. You're right. I wanted to give you a good example too. And this is about color coding. A lot of times when you see graphs in science and mathematics textbooks, they are either in black and white or they are in color and they're line graphs. And that's all very well and good if you have normal vision. If you have color vision issues, you're going to have a lot of problems telling which one of these was for which year. But this author on this graph did something really nice. Notice in the key that not only is the color indicated for each year that's shown on this multi-year graph, but there is a different symbol, a square, a circle, a triangle, and a diamond given for the various years. So even if you were looking at that in black and white or had color vision issues, you could tell which line belonged to which year. So there's a good example. We did find some positive findings, which was nice. Um, the, we found good readability level and good organization in some of the PDFs that we looked at. We saw some good consistency and we did find one PDF that had an excellent glossary. And Una, you said that you would be willing to share samples of that if people wanted, correct? Um, yes, I can share the website at the end if we want. Um. And Marion asked uh, some very important questions. What was done in the old days before digital? There was no alt text. There is no alt text in a book. So if you give a book to a blind person and they have a human reader, then the human reader must describe the book and, and all of the illustrations in it in addition to reading the text. I'm a volunteer reader for Learning Ally, which is a company that um, creates audio textbooks. And I specialize in reading organic chemistry textbooks, if you can believe being an, a blind student in organic chemistry. And so in addition to reading the text, I have to describe all of the diagrams, the charts, the graphs, the tables, everything like that. So we came up with a conclusion and uh, Marion asks, the volunteer reader concept, is this still accepted? Yes, it is. And Una will talk a little bit more about formatting and ways that it's, ways that it's used in, in towards the end of this presentation. We have four conclusions that we came up with in how to build accessibility into open educational resources. Authors and creators of those resources, first of all, need to be aware of the necessity of accessibility. It's the law and that makes it necessary. And it's also very appropriate for your students. They need, secondly, how-to knowledge. How do they make these accessible? If every PDF we looked at was inaccessible, what needs to be known by authors to make them accessible? 
they may need professional assistance. As I pointed out before, you might be a great chemistry professor and you might really know how to write curriculum and materials for chemistry, but you might not really be very good at setting up a website. So you may need some professional assistance there. And it's usually available on campus. Your IT department would probably be thrilled to help you put your website together. Um, there also need to be incentives because it's easy to put together something that is inaccessible. It does take more effort to make it accessible. So what is the incentive for doing that? Back to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Um, um, yeah, Marion makes a, 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 a interesting comment about IT at the community colleges. We don't have as much IT support, um, so disability services is the place to go for um, support uh, around students with learning disabilities. Um, in addition, um, if you are developing your own curriculum materials uh, online, it may be your distance ed coordinator and the staff in that department who would be more likely to assist you at the community college level. I think, Alice, what you were referring to is more at the four-year where there's larger IT departments. Um, Okay, and we got some other interesting stuff from um, Jerry. Uh, I believe this is Jerry Hanley from CSU. So I'll let the chat window continue. So open textbooks um, are are changing now. Um, they started out as PDFs and web pages, um, but a new format has been emerging, which is EPUB, which is the new mobile um, format, which allows reflowing of the uh, text and pictures on different size devices. And um, it, instructional materials online are incorporating sound and movies, so audio and video capabilities. And with that comes, you know, a really wonderful, engaging material for our students, but um, it does um, add an extra level of complexity to making sure that um, those materials are accessible. Um, DAISY um, is the um, Accessible Information System Consortium. It's been around for over a decade. It's an international consortium um, that um, works on standards for digital talking books. So these are for the print disabled. And um, two of the transcribers um, are Bookshare and Learning Ally, which um, Alice mentioned earlier, um, and both of these organizations do use volunteers uh, for transcription. In particular, for um, for doing alt images. Now, um, Alice mentions that she's uh, doing the alt images for organic chemistry. Well. Uh, what she didn't mention, she was very modest about that, is that she actually has um, expertise in that area. So these these um, these um, organizations are always looking for volunteers with specific expertise so that they can write the descriptions of the sometimes highly complex um, materials so that students can um, um, have that information. Um, standards for mobile, um, EPUB is, is becoming the new text and graphic um, format. This is the downloadable format, so you would download this onto your smartphone or um, onto a, another device. could even be a, a laptop computer. And um, what um, Bookshare has specifically told us is that they prefer to receive um, their materials in EPUB if they can. So they, um, working under the Chaffee Amendment, um, Bookshare and Learning Ally can actually go out to publishers and ask for a textbook to provide to a learner with disabilities. And they prefer to get that in PDF because they can then convert it to DAISY directly, which is the format for the DAISY reader, or they can then further convert it to Braille for um, students uh, who are blind and still use Braille. Um, PDF is, is sort of being deprecated in this environment. Um, it, number one, as Alice pointed out, it's often not done correctly. Um, 
the so moving the structural information in a document and putting it into the into a PDF for uh, sorry a PDF format often um, loses the information that is necessary for a, say a screen reader to um, read a PDF correctly. Um, PDF was designed for printers. And, it, and so it doesn't have a concept of being dynamic. It has a concept of looking the same on all printers. So um, look for EPUB, which um, Apple actually made a big splash of when they shipped the iPad last year of supporting EPUB. And more and more of the um, smart, and I should, I'm not sure about the smartphone, but more and more of the tablet type um, devices are supporting EPUB. So much of this falls under an umbrella called Universal Design for Learning. And um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that out there. Uh, maybe show of hands. Um, universal Design for Learning actually comes from a, a broader um, movement, which is Universal Design, which started uh, probably back in the 70s or 80s. Um, and it was about designing products so that can, they can be used by everyone uh, regardless of um, disability. And um, probably the most famous example um, in, in sort of architecture is the curb cut. So curb cuts were designed back in the, in the 70s and 80s uh, to make um, urban and suburban landscapes accessible to folks in wheelchairs. So since that time, many of us have gotten curb cuts in our cities um, and so forth. And you will see that everybody uses them. Here is a parent with a child in a stroller, um, bicycle. Um, people with luggage on wheels use curb cuts. So it's one of those things that was designed in such a way that um, the general population could benefit from it. Um, in the learning environment, we talked about video captioning and how that was designed for um, people with audio impairment, but in fact is now used generally um, by um, everyone. The National Center on Universal Design for Learning um, has three guiding principles. Um, and this is just a wonderful um, website. It's in your handout. Um, the, three, the three guiding principles are multiple modes of representation, so you know, where there are sensory issues in one area provided in another. So this is kind of the audio and the, and the visual. So provide things both ways if you can. Um, in terms of allowing students to interact with materials, give them multiple ways to interact and to express uh, their learning. And around engagement, um, this is around helping students to um, connect with, their, um, with previous knowledge. So it's very much of a constructivist approach um, in terms of providing your material so that um, people can build upon a, uh, you know, a subculture of learning and take, take this new knowledge in and integrate it into their, their own learning. And they have, a, as I mentioned, a great website which will give you specific guidelines around the principles of universal design for learning and specifically how to use that. So um, this is um, this slide is uh, has the first two items here are available for um, all educators in the California Community Colleges and um, the High Tech Training Center unit. We have uh, we have them in uh, they're actually located not too far from where I'm located here in Northern California. They provide online and face-to-face -face training. They also have a, a great website, which is on your handout, um, with um, information on how to convert um, all your online materials. So for those of you who are distance instructors, uh, they have materials for how to convert your Word documents, your PDFs, your PowerPoints, uh, to make them accessible to learners with disabilities. Another fortunate thing that we have here in the California Community College system is we have a video captioning grant. So any distance education materials that you're producing or online materials for your classes where you do have video, um, you can get that captioned for free. Um, and that grant is administered by the College of the Canyons. Also a link on your handout. 
And then the College Open Textbooks website, uh, our accessibility reviews are available to everyone um, regardless of location or institutional affiliation. All right. <laughs> we um, invite you to join our College Open Textbooks community if you haven't had a chance to do that. We have a Ning uh, site online which is free and open to, uh, to join. Uh, we post uh, events of interest. Um, we have special interest groups on, on that site, including an accessibility um, um, interest group that you can join and um, share information with others who are interested in the same area. Our College Open Textbooks Org main website is where our reviews, our peer reviews, and our accessibility reviews, and lots of other resource um, information is available. Uh, Alice's uh, Virtual Ability um, website has many resources also on, on um, disabilities. Um, Alice, would you like to add something else about your website? Just that the work that we did, although the people we employed were part of our Second Life community, the work that they did was in their own computer in their own home. So it's not necessary to use a virtual world to do the work that we did. But we also do evaluate educational materials that are used in virtual worlds. They have their own unique set of accessibility issues. All right. Thank you, Alice. Um, so at this point, we're, we're open for general questions. Um, I noticed that a number of you, or at least one person mentioned um, that they did not um, get uh, their handout. Uh, so for some reason, it didn't come through the interface. Um, why don't you go ahead and email me at dailyuna at shda.edu. That's the uh, last email address email address there at the bottom and I will send you, um, I'll send a reply to your message and I'll attach the um, handout for that. All right. Um, I need to go back here and take a look at some of the questions. All right. We have a comment here from Carla about creating accessible PDFs. And um, there are some other solutions besides Adobe. Um, Jacques has asked, um, he wants to hear more about EPUB and connect to those who have developed with EPUB. Um, Jacques, uh, there is, um, EPUB is a consortium. They, they have a, a website. Um, and Apple has made a fairly big deal about providing tools out of, um, I think it's their Pages product. Uh, so you can uh, use their Pages product and, um, convert to EPUB directly. Um, but there's, there's quite a few EPUB readers out there that are free, and I, be, and I believe there are converters that are free as well. Um, I haven't played with those in about six months, um, but there, look for some free uh, EPUB readers and um, converters from, say, Word um, that, that um, are available for download. Um, I am still waiting here for a few more questions. We have about five more minutes. Okay. Uh, I've got, all right, go ahead. Jacques, you want to speak up? You can um, click on your mic, Jacques, to speak. Um, the mic uh, is down in the bottom of your, um, the bottom left column of the window. Okay, that's not you. Okay. All right. Your mic doesn't connect. Okay, well, I'm going to read your question here. Have you got developers with EPUB that you know about that I could talk to? Um, 
I, I don't directly work with um, EPUB developers, but um, Jacques, I could put you in touch with some of the folks at Connections. Connections is one of the repositories that we work closely with and that Alice evaluated some of their textbooks. And this last summer, they made all of their materials available in EPUB. Pre previous to that, they were available on, in web modules and in PDF. Um, and they added EPUB because they knew that their PDF was not accessible. And so they wanted to um, improve on that. And even though their PDF um, still remains inaccessible, you can download EPUB, which is accessible from the Connections website. And um, if you email me, Jacques, I will um, get you in touch with some people at Connections. Oh, thank you, Alice. All right, and Carla added a website containing guidelines to creating accessible documents with standard Office tools. All right, thanks very much for that, Carla. All right. Um, I'm going to ask Alice to watch the window here. We have just a couple more minutes. I was going to take you out to um, take you off my to my desktop here for our last few minutes. And um, I hope that uh, you can see this is the College Open Textbook website, and this is uh, the page where we have our accessibility reviews. Um, and Alice showed you an example of one of ours. Um, which was the collaborative statistics. But here is a list of almost 100 open textbooks that were evaluated for accessibility. And for instance, you can see this poor textbook was not very accessible. Um, we're not going to. And this one, collaborative statistics, um, uh, turned out to be quite accessible. So um, they do vary quite a bit. And often it's not the intention of the author or creator to be inaccessible, but it's simply a lack of awareness on what it takes. And I was going to show you one other thing. This is our community, um, our College Open Textbooks community. This is the free name that you can join. And um, we have our events posted here. And then down here on the right-hand side, we have special interest groups. Uh, we have an advocate trainer, an adopter community, librarians, um, and finally accessibility. And uh, we have 14 members in that group. Um, and we'd be happy to have more folks join uh, this group and discuss issues around accessibility. All right. Well, um, at this point, um, I think Alice and I both want to say thank you very much for attending today. Um, we're happy to answer follow-up questions that you may have. Our email is there on the screen. And um, Alice, any closing comments? Thank you, everyone, for attending. All right. And, and thank you, um, Tara and the um, online technology uh, sorry, the online teaching conference for um, asking us. And we are going to um, turn off the recording at this time. And Alice and I will be around for a few more minutes if you if you want to catch us in the chat window. <laughs>